Thank you very much to the organizers of this wonderful conference, uh, so stimulating, so cheerful, so uplifting in so many ways, including that wonderful session on the, on the United Nations, uh, I guess, General Assembly, that is what it was. No, later, later, later. Um, you know that um, in, in the late 1920s and early 1930s were actually a very difficult time for, for, for humanity. This was the time of the Great Depression. Um, the global economy had imploded. There was high rate of unemployment. We had behind us World War I, you know, with 18 million casualties. And so it will not surprise you to learn that there was a sense of disquiet, a sense of, uh, um, uh, you know, danger and, and concern about the future. And at that time, in 1931, the head of the Baha'i community... Maybe remove this pedestal because you are very far away from the mind. You're so tall. Thank you. Sorry for the interruption. Okay. And in 1931, the head of the Baha'i community, um, Shoghi Effendi, <coughs> wrote a letter um, in which he said that <clears throat> the reason for this disquiet, the reason for this sense of, of, of uh, dissatisfaction with the condition of the world, um, ultimately <clears throat> was because our economic and political institutions had not changed in a way that reflected the very fundamental changes that were underway in the world and that therefore they were not fit for purpose, um, that they were no longer able to meet the challenges of the time. And this was 1931, right? I wanted to share that quote with you because it seems to me it remains valid today, 91 la years later. However, in 1945, against the background of the calamities, the destruction, the, the suffering, the killing and the maiming of World War II, where 60 million people died in that, in that horrible conflict, there was an attempt to rethink our global order. There was an attempt to go back to the words of Shoghi Effendi and to say, yes, let's see what we can do to establish a new order that will ensure peace and security, and that in particular will prevent this calamity from ever happening again. Um, it's really interesting to study the, 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 the period of the early 1940s, you know, as, the world, as World War II was underway, as we were killing brothers and sisters with industrial efficiency. And it was perhaps not surprising that in that early part of the war, uh, Franklin Roosevelt invited Winston Churchill to come to Washington and to basically say, after the war is over, after we defeat the Nazis, we have to get together and we have to establish an organization that will allow us to avoid this catastrophe in the future. And that is how the United Nations was born. Um, that period of 1942-43 was an interesting period because there was a lot of soul searching, a lot of thinking, you know, what kind of a United Nations organization do we want to establish? On what principles? What jurisdiction do we want to give it? Um, what constraints, if any, do we want to impose on it? And if I had been alive at that time, which, which I wasn't, I would have been very excited by the nature of those early discussions because what they were thinking, the people who participated in those conversations, is to perhaps create something like a world parliament, a body that would have universal representation from its members, and that would be given certain attributes to, to, do, to pass international law that would be binding on its members. Unfortunately, that broad, ambitious vision was not realized, was not realized because some countries, including the Soviet Union and the United States, were not ready yet you know, for that, for that uh, more ambitious vision of creating a truly global organization with the ability to effectively create you know, international law. And so what happened is that in, in the spring of 1945, we had this conference in San Francisco. 
It lasted a couple of months, and then at the end of the conference, 51 nations, including India, and I'm sure many of the countries represented by the distinguished judges today, adopted the United Nations. Um, during those, those years, leading up to the adoption of the UN Charter, and even after the adoption uh, of the Charter, there was a sense of, you know, are we missing out on a great opportunity? Are these 60 million casualties and the death and the suffering, you know, in a sense, um, an opportunity that we are not seizing? We have a once in a lifetime chance to actually make fundamental changes to our global order, and yet we have created this organization that is flawed in so many ways. And so, for instance, Albert Einstein, he wrote a, a letter, an open letter to the General Assembly in 1947. Um, Albert Einstein was a public personality who when he spoke, people listened. He could easily get a, a radio interview that would have, you know, international, international coverage. And he said, you know, this General Assembly that you have created, um, the members are actually representatives, they're diplomats, they're representing the party in power back in the capital. The members of this body should be directly elected, and if we were to do this, they would have greater democratic legitimacy. I think it is a very sound observation, uh, and that is how, in a sense, you know, the idea of creating a world parliamentary assembly, a, a second chamber attached to the general assembly, and giving it an advisory role, um, you know, was was giving impetus. Bertrand Russell great mathematician and English philosopher, he was also active in those debates at that time. And to me, because he was a logician, because he had a, 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 an extremely insightful and clear-headed mind, he said the following. It was an article that he wrote in the, in the mid-1940s. He said, wars will come to an end if and only if the aggressor knows that he will be defeated. If you think about it, there is some, some incontrovertible logic to it. Wars will come to an end if and only end the aggressor knows that he will be defeated. And of course, after saying that, he then proposed this body that we have just created, the United Nations, should be given the instrumentality to actually deliver peace and security. We should give it an international military force under the control of the United Nations itself. And this body, this, this, this force should be multilational. It should be able to intervene in situations where there is genocide, where there is violation of the very basic principles of the, of the United Nations. And, and yet, <clears throat> the United Nations Charter does introduce the concept of, of, of uh, collective security. The United Nations does call upon its members to contribute soldiers and, and weapons and so on in the interests of justice. It's interesting, when this debate was taking place around the drafting of the UN Charter, the Americans, <clears throat> and this is in the minutes, this is, there, this, this is not a speculation, there is historical evidence to support what I'm about to say. The Americans were saying, what kind of a contribution are we, the biggest uh, and most powerful military in the world, uh, are, are we going to make to this international military force that is envisioned in the UN Charter at, you know, un under the control of the Security Council? And they said, well, maybe we can contribute 300,000 soldiers, 25,000, 2,500 aircraft, and of course all the other weapons and, and equipment that you need to intervene in a situation where there is a violation of the principles of the UN Charter. It's interesting, it's fascinating. Um, of course, it never happened, it never happened, because soon after the, the adoption of the UN Charter, we were in the middle of the Cold War. Um, the Soviets were more interested in matching up uh, uh, and creating the, the weapons uh, that the Americans already had, the nuclear weapons. And you know the story, right? For the next several days, what we had was an arms race. We didn't have creative thinking about how to strengthen the the, the framework for peace and security. And then, of course, Grenville Clark, another luminary of the time, he said, you know, this idea of one country, one vote in the General Assembly, it's not really fair. Um, 
there should be, there should be a linkage between, for instance, the size of the population of the country and the voting power of the, of the, of the country in the General Assembly. So we should have a system of weighted voting. And uh, he pointed out that this principle of one country, one vote was actually a cynical ploy on the part of the founders to actually transfer all the political power to the Security Council where, behold, the five permanent members had veto power. And so Grenville Clark was very critical of the veto power. He said, you know, how can you defend a principle which is so anti-democratic? Can you, how can you defend a principle that effectively exempts the permanent members from the very principles embedded in the charter which they are signing when they are adopting it? And you know the history of the veto power. We have seen the evidence of it multiple times in the last 77 years, including most recently when Russia in violation of every principle of the UN Charter, invaded uh, Ukraine in an unprovoked way, and is still a member in good standing of the United Nations. Its foreign minister can go to the meetings and sit in the Security Council, even though his country is a violator of the, of the principles of the Charter, right? So that is the, 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 the situation. Um, and I am not being overly critical of the United Nations. The United Nations had had some great achievements in its history. It was responsible for the process of decolonization. It would not have happened so effectively and so quickly without the, the leadership role of the UN. The UN has 193 members today. It had 51 in San Francisco. And that, 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 that the difference in, in great, to a great extent reflects the process of decolonization. The United Nations in 1948 adopted the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. As a result of that, our human rights framework, the legal framework for human rights, has improved dramatically in a way that perhaps we would not have anticipated in 1948, and so on. But as you know, it has its own failures. And for that reason, perhaps, no, but before I got there, let, let, me, let me give you a personal anecdote. You know, I was in New York in September during the General Assembly week. The organization which I direct, the Global Governance Forum, is a civil society organization, but is very much uh, involved in these conversations around you know, the future uh, and around the kind of uh, reforms that we want to make you know, to turn our global governance architecture in something that is more sensible for the 21st century. So I was in New York, and one of the things that I was really impressed about was the sense of emergency, the sense of disquiet, the sense of um, um, deep worry, I would say even fear about the future because of what is happening to climate change and its impending calamities, because the scientists have already been warning us and their warnings are becoming increasingly strident. Um, a year ago, the, the, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change issued a report that essentially says we have 10 years and if we don't take the appropriate steps within the next decade, it's going to be too late. And all we are going to be able to do going forward is, is simply adapt to the impending calamities, which are going to bring, of course, a great deal of suffering to humanity. So in the middle of this, of these, these social, uh, civil society gatherings that I was attending and sensing this sense of disquiet, the sense of emergency, the sense that we're facing these global catastrophic risks and that we're not doing what needs to be done, um, I read with, with, with interest, or I reread, I should say, this statement published by uh, um, Secretary General Antonio Gutierrez, Our Common Agenda. It's a worthwhile document. It's a good diagnosis of what's wrong with the world. And, and it has useful suggestions as to what are some steps that we take to address some of these, some of these problems. But at the end of page two, at the end of the executive summary, Secretary um, Gutierrez calls for a summit of the future. And it's a long story. It was initially supposed to take place next year, but now it will take place in 2024. And what is this summit of the future going to be for? Well, he says, so that, <clears throat> so that we consult on what kind of future we want and how do we get there. Well, those are very laudable goals. I think it's a very nice way to frame 
the purposes of an important summit that will bring supposedly you know the heads of state of all the countries in in, in the world um, and uh, what I like to put forward to you is that of these two objectives which he has established, the answer to the first one, what kind of a world we want, is already known. We already, we already have the answer to that question. There is broad international consensus. Take it from me, I travel around the world. I am in India today. I am in The Hague in the, in the Netherlands next week. Um, as you try, and, and because of my previous job, I, I was the director of one of the research groups at the World Bank for, for, you know, for the past decade. And in that capacity, I traveled to Asia, to Latin America, to Africa, to you know, multiple locations. And when I travel, I talk to people. I, I get a sense of what is in their minds, what is in their hearts, what moves them, what motivates them, what, what are the sources of fear. And I am utterly convinced that there is a universal, con universal consensus on what kind of future we want. And what is that future? Well, we want a future in which we are going to be hopefully liberated from some of the worst consequences of climate change. People have this sense of emergency. We need to do something about it. It is a future in which hopefully we are going to lib be liberated forever from from the possibilities of the use of nuclear weapons. We don't want that. In 1945, the world changed in a fundamental way because we developed weapons with the capacity to destroy all of us. If there is an, if there is an exchange of nuclear weapons between two superpowers a, a few years from now, it is going to have absolutely global systemic implications. It will be felt everywhere. It could lead to a nuclear winter, which will devastate our crops and lead to mass starvation. So these are the kinds of issues that we face. And if you ask people, should we do away with these evil weapons? Should we enter into a process of disarmament and, and be done with them forever and ever so that our children and our grandchildren don't live with the threat of extinction? And the answer to that question everywhere, overwhelmingly, is going to be yes, absolutely, we must do that. Our politicians must get their act together and move in that direction. Do we want to have a world in which we have finally eliminated extreme poverty, malnutrition, illiteracy? Yes, of course. That is embedded in the Sustainable Development Goals. Although my colleagues at the World Bank tell me that SDG number one on the elimination of extreme poverty is probably out of reach. Uh, which, is, which will be because of COVID, because of the war in the Ukraine because of you know, inflation and high commodity prices and so on. So that is the kind of world that we look forward to. So with all respect to Secretary General Antonio Guterres, I would say, I would submit to him that the emphasis in this summit of the future would be rather on the second part of his, of his statement, which is how do we get there? We already know what that future should look like. The question is, how do we get there? And so, in one of these meetings in New York, um, a, high, a, a meeting that brought together members of the high-level advisory panel, which uh, Secretary Gutierrez has created to advise him about the summit of the future, um, the Global Governance Forum, working with other organizations, put a proposal on the table. And I want to, I want to mention this to you. Not because it is a proposal of our organization, but because I think it is a potentially interesting way to reframe the purpose of that summit. You see, because we want to avoid a situation where the 2024 Summit of the Future just becomes another UN summit, uh, where, which is good, good on paper. It generates a few headlines in the media. And then the following day, it has not improved in any significant way the lives of our young students here sitting in the back and people every, everywhere, right? So we must avoid that. We could afford to have those kinds of summits 10, 20, 30 years ago because perhaps the nature of the risks that we were, fa we were facing were, were not so intense, were not so, so, so dramatic. But now, this is 2022. Now the scientists are telling the window of opportunity is closing. We must act now, right? So let me explain in a few minutes <clears throat> the, what is the idea. All right, I need to go back a little bit into the past. 
1945 in San Francisco, there were a group of 17 countries led by New Zealand. Uh, Prime Minister Robert Fraser was there, and by Mexico, that were totally outraged. Disappointed is not really the appropriate word. I was about to say disappointed. No, they were outraged at the introduction of the veto. You know, the Dutch delegation a few months before at a conference in Yalta, attended by Stalin and Roosevelt and Churchill, they had already warned these three uh, uh, heads of state, if you introduce this veto, it is going to turn the United Nations into a useless organization because it is not going to be able to address conflicts between the major powers or conflicts that involve you know, an ally of a major power. Why? Well, because the, the veto will be exercised, right? And so you're going to limit the effectiveness of the organization in a, in a very fundamental way. So thus, the Dutch delegation was already warning. Well, in San Francisco, there was this sense of disquiet and many countries, these 17 countries were threatening that they would not adopt the, the charter. They would just not, not do it, sorry. We can't sign here, it's against our principles. And so to placate them, to meet halfway their concerns, the members, and in particular the Soviets and the Americans, who were the two leads in, that, in those discussions, said we're going to introduce an article in the UN Charter, now the famous Article 109, right, which basically allows for the possibility of reviewing the Charter in the future. If you read Article 109, as every article in the UN Charter, it's very short, it has been drafted by very able lawyers, it basically says that you know, within a 10 year period, we can have a general review conference to examine the appropriateness of the Charter. It admits the possibility, as Shoghi Effendi said in 1931, that the world might change and that we, want, we might want to turn this document into a living document that changes and evolves to meet the conditions of a changing world. And so with that article, uh, 15 of the 17 members said, okay, fine, we are going to sign the charter, and two actually were not persuaded. And they, they, they did not vote in favor of the charter, but because the charter was ultimately approved by the majority, they did become members of, of, of the United Nations. One of them was actually Colombia. Colombians were not persuaded by Article 109. And so on we went, and then 1955 came, and the conference did not take place, the review conference. The, the holding of the conference could not be vetoed, by the way. It could not be vetoed by the permanent members. It only requires the, the support of two-thirds of the General Assembly and nine of the 15 members of the Security Council. It cannot be vetoed. But by 1955, you know, we were in the middle of the Cold War. You know, our attention was, was, was elsewhere. And so we lost that opportunity. And in fact, that review conference has never taken place in 77 years, which is the reason why the UN Charter is not a living document. It is dead letter in many ways. And it has turned the United Nations organization not into an organization that met the promises of 1945 against the background of the calamities of World War II, but rather an organization that has struggled, that has few resources, that it has been impotent in many, in many times when we have had vast human suffering. So our proposal, and I am really grateful for Gita Kingdom you know, for inviting me to this conference because I am aware that I speak before judges who are themselves influential in their own countries. The proposal basically says, let's put on the agenda of the summit of the future in 2004, consideration of the holding of such a conference finally, once and for all, to meet the challenges of the moment, to meet the challenges of the 21st century. Um, you know, we're not prejudging the outcome. We're not saying, let's do this, let's, let's eliminate the veto, let's, no. That is to be the next step. Once the summit of the future says, yes, we will have a review conference, say, in 2026, hopefully before 2030, because the times are urgent, the, 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 the moment requires it, we need to move quickly, 
Then at that conference, you know, we will have a consultation, a broad-based consultation, and my hope is that India will play a important catalytic role in that conference. Why? Well, because next year India is going to be the most populous country in the world. We cannot think about the kinds of changes that we want to make to the, to the UN Charter without the insight and the participation of India um, and its uh, vast and young population. So India will clearly play a, a, a far more critical role in that new vision of global governance than it did in 1945 when it was a small country, you know, a, a, a developing country. And, um, what is the downside, I ask you? You know, we, we become cynics sometimes, right? It, it's very easy to become a cynic in today's world, unfortunately. You know, we have corrupt politicians, we have countries that are run by kleptocrats who have no intention of serving the people. Their only motivation is to remain in power and to enrich themselves. Um, I see with, with great uh, satisfaction in that in one of the afternoon sessions, you are going to be looking at the proposal on the establishment of an international anti-corruption court. Uh, I'd like to let you know that I am a co-chair of the International Committee on the Establishment of an International Anti-Corruption Court, because I think that this would be a very important, uh, a, a very important uh, uh, reform to improve our, our uh, global governance architecture, right? But that's a separate subject. So let me conclude simply by saying there is no downside to considering the possible holding of a review conference at the summit of the future. Um, we're not prejudging the outcome. Um, we are simply saying, let's have that consultation. Let's have that conversation. Um, let's hear out the Indians and the, and the Africans and the Latin Americans and all the voices of the world as to what kind of a future do we want and how do we get there. We owe it to future generations. Because my friends, and let me conclude, the alternative, if we don't seize the moment, the alternative is that the next few years, I don't even want to say decades. I don't even want to say decades, because that leads to a sense of complacency. And the scientists are saying, it's not decades that we have, it's, it's years, right? The next, if we don't seize the moment, if we don't take the initiative, and set the basis for a rethinking of our global governance framework and therefore the UN Charter, which is at the heart of it, then the next few years are going to be very, very painful. They will lead to a lot of needless suffering. They will be dislocating uh, our peoples. COVID-19 is, is a warning sign. There will be other pandemics. Uh, the scientists are already saying that because the pandemics are a reflection of some of the some of the inefficiencies that we have in in our economic system. I don't have time to elaborate on that, but you know, uh, and, and 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 there are so so many other multiple problems which are on the horizon, right? So we need to take the initiative. We we need to step ahead. Um, and you judges, in particular, you have a special responsibility because you have credible voices in your own countries. You are a separate branch of government. You have a degree of independence. You can express opinions on global issues. You can become public figures you know, without, without undermining your credibility as judges. And of course, all of us, including you, distinguished judges, have a stake in the future of, 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 of the world. We want to create a peaceful world. We want to create a world where these wonderful children who participate in, in this UN uh, debate you know, will have a future, will, will, will not face the kinds of calamities that are coming our way because we, the adults in the room, our governments, our civil society organizations, our business community have failed them and have failed to take the challenge of creating a new world for them. Um, thank you very much for the opportunity. It has been a pleasure to share these thoughts with you. Thank you.